It's Tuesday, December 13th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, the origins and significance of the song Silent Night. Plus, an update on the U.S.'s fusion energy breakthrough. And Los Angeles County's first ever unicorn license has been issued. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. It's that time of year when everywhere you go is playing Christmas music. It's inescapable. Personally, I love Christmas music, but I know that when the only same songs get played over and over again for over a month, it can get old. I agree with that. What I like about Christmas music, though, is that there is so much out there. I mean, there's no excuse for just playing the same handful of songs or same versions of those songs ad nauseum, because the amount of Christmas-themed songs that exist in the world is truly dizzying. Nearly every musical artist has released a Christmas album, putting their own spin on classics and writing some originals to add to the genre, if we could call it a genre. Bruce David Forbes, in his brief history of the Christmas holiday, Christmas A Candid History, makes a distinction between three types of Christmas music, hymns, carols, and commercial pop music. By his delineation, hymns are the kind that you would find in a hymnal at a Christian church, and which you probably rarely encounter outside of that context. Many of them were written in the medieval and reformation eras and composed by monks and theologians. They tend to focus on the nativity and, predictably, the most religious side of the holiday. Christmas carols, however, are a wider category. Quoting Forbes, Historians and musicologists do not agree on the definition of a Christmas carol. Some use the phrase to refer to all Christmas vocal music, while others prefer to limit it to widely known tunes and lyrics with a religious focus, somewhat closer to folk songs. I prefer the more limited definition. Here I think of the kind of songs that high school church youth groups sing when they go caroling down the sidewalks. Most of the carols are not really folk songs because their composers and authors are known, but these are the favorite familiar religious songs that people like to sing, such as Joy to the World, O Little Town of Bethlehem, and It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. End quote. And then the commercial Christmas music is pretty self-explanatory. That's the more secular songs that were popularized over the last century with the intent of making money. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, White Christmas, All I Want for Christmas is You. But I bring this up because I want to talk about the origins and spread of one song in particular that I think kind of bridges the gap a bit between Forbes' definition of a hymn and of a carol. I mean, it is definitely a carol, but it was written quite a while ago and was written by a priest. But he was no Reformation-era bishop. He was a cool priest in the early 1800s. He played guitar. The song in question is Silent Night. Since being written in the 1810s, it has been translated into over 300 languages, covered in every style you could imagine, and even bestowed with one of those UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage designations, which I mentioned earlier this month. Remember the baguette getting the same designation? Link in the show notes if you missed that episode. The priest in question was Austrian Joseph Moore. According to musicologist Sarah Eyerly from Florida State University, he was working as an assistant priest at a congregation in the town of Maria Far, a town, like many in Europe, that was going through a very rough time. As Eyerly situates it, the fallout from the recently ended Napoleonic Wars, as well as the climate changes from the eruption of the Mount Tambora volcano, which led to the infamous Year Without a Summer, link to my previous episode on that in the show notes, had led to poverty, crop failure, famine, and trauma. In that fall of 1816, Moore wrote a poem. Though we don't have a record of what inspired Moore, we can assume that his motivation, at least in part, was to bring hope to his congregation during a rough time. And what resulted was a six-verse poem called Stille Nacht. Those six verses make it twice as long as most modern English translations of what would become the song Silent Night. While repeatedly making mention of salvation and the Son of Christ, the ultimate message is one of love, calm, and hope. 
In the next year, Moore was transferred to the town of Oberndorf near Salzburg to a parish coincidentally named after St. Nicholas. There, he befriended the church organist and local school teacher Franz Gruber. When Christmas rolled around again in 1818, Moore asked Gruber to compose a melody for his poem that would work for two voices and a guitar. Moore liked what Gruber put together, and that Christmas Eve, the two performed it for the congregation with Gruber singing bass and Moore singing tenor and playing guitar. Here is a sample of what that might have sounded like, recorded by the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation in 1995, based on sheet music written by Gruber many years later. Many accounts tell a story of the church organ having been broken due to flooding in the area, hence why Moore had to perform the song on guitar instead. But according to the Silent Night Association, there isn't any evidence for this supposition. They hold some of the only primary documents signed by Moore and Gruber with the sheet music and written accounts of the origin of the song, none of which make any reference to a broken organ. Some accounts also say that the song was performed after the Christmas Eve service due to the fact that it was accompanied by guitar and not by the traditional organ, and was not a traditional hymn. This is another detail that gets frequently repeated, but which we don't have solid evidence for. If anything, the Silent Night Association remarks that the song was included in the Christmas Mass. But if it wasn't, and the fact that it was a newer piece written after most other Christmas hymns and written specifically for guitar, not organ, does make it more of a Christmas carol than a Christmas hymn, even though it was written by a priest and does focus on the nativity. Classification aside, though, the song resonated with the congregation. Gruber's account notes that the song was met by, quote, "...general approval by all." Ierly, the musicologist, offers this analysis, quote, The melody and harmonization of Silent Night is actually based on an Italian musical style called the Siciliana that mimics the sound of water and rolling waves, two large rhythmic beats split into three parts each. In this way, Gruber's music reflected the daily soundscape of Moore's congregation who lived and worked along the Salzach River, end quote. But the song wouldn't stay in their small town. Ireley continues, citing that same account written by Gruber, quote, The song first became popular in nearby Zillertal Valley. From there, two traveling families of folk singers, the Strassers and the Rainers, included the tune in their shows. The song then became popular across Europe and eventually in America, where the Rainers sang it on Wall Street in 1839. At the same time, German-speaking missionaries spread the song from Tibet to Alaska and translated it into local languages. By the mid-19th century, Silent Night had even made its way to the sub-Arctic Inuit communities along the Labrador coast, where it was translated into Inuktitut as Inuak Openak, end quote. How did the song first spread to Zillertal Valley? Well, here's where we might close the gap on that broken church organ story. In Gruber's 1854 account, he says the song was brought from Oberndorf to Zillertal by Karl Moracher, an organ builder. Moracher did indeed repair Gruber's organ in at least 1821, a few years after the song was written and had already begun to spread. So even though we have no record of him visiting and fixing an organ in early 1819, shortly after the song would have premiered that Christmas Eve, I can see how people might have made that assumption over the years. According to the BBC, that assumption started gaining ground after a fictional story about the origin of the song was published in the US in the 1930s. 
Perhaps the most famous story associated with song is of the Christmas truce during World War I, when, according to some accounts, the shooting stopped and a German officer began singing the original German version of the song. Recognizing it, British soldiers sang it back to them in English, and all the troops then made their way to no man's land and shared a Christmas celebration together. As Stanley Weintraub, the author of the book Silent Night, the story of the World War I Christmas truce, put it in an interview with Daybreak South back in 2014, quote, It has to begin with something, and it did begin with elements of shared culture. If it hadn't been for shared culture, certainly there would have been no Christmas truce. End quote. That is certainly one of the most enduring aspects of this song, of so much Christmas music, really, but Silent Night illustrates it perhaps better than them all. It spread across so many nations and some different cultures. Not all cultures, of course, because we are still talking about mostly Christian ones here, but this is one of the Christmas songs that, for all its mention of nativity and its lyrics, often resonates more broadly. As Ierly put it, quote, The song's fundamental message of peace, even in the midst of suffering, has bridged cultures and generations. Great songs do this. They speak of hope in hard times and of beauty that arises from pain. They offer comfort and solace, and they are inherently human and infinitely adaptable. End quote. When I hear Silent Night begin, I sometimes hear the voice of Phil Spector in my head, coming in to thank everyone for listening to his 1963 Christmas album featuring the Ronettes, Darling Love, the Crystals, the Blue Jeans, and more. It is such a solid album, but that ending track with him talking over Silent Night always sticks in my head. I'm kind of into the spoken thank you from the recording booth set over music trend, the Beach Boys did it over Auld Lang Syne on their Christmas album in 1964, and I feel like it happened on a lot of pop albums in the 90s as well. But there are so many covers of Silent Night out there, a lot of really good gospel and R&B versions. One of my favorite, more original ones is a cover by Andrew W.K. that he did for AV Club back in 2010. It starts with the usual slower reverence, but then turns into a total bop about halfway through. Here's a quick listen to part of that version. More typically, though, I do enjoy the solemn versions, which took off later. The original Silent Night was a bit more moderate in tempo and tone. It was later, especially after being translated to English, that it took on a sort of slower reverence. But I like that version because I feel like it matches the tone of the season, one of darkness and often hardship, but one in which we try very hard to find or to create some light. Yes, this can be a very happy and, dare I say, jolly time of year. But the things that make it so, all these songs and traditions from various faiths and cultures, we invented them because this time of year is tough. Darker days, plants dried up for the season, gloomy weather, traditions centering light, and the few plants that still had color to them in the winter, and whatever things we could find to celebrate, like feasts with a lot of meat because it was only fresh this time of year because people wouldn't slaughter their animals until it was cold enough to keep them preserved, or crops that were a bit fresher from their fall harvests. All of those celebrations started because we needed something to look forward to. Though we don't know exactly why he wrote Still in Nacht, we do know what the world was like when Joseph Moore penned those verses. His community was recovering from war, and an essentially year-long winter that led to hunger and intense struggle. He didn't write lyrics about how his congregation was happy simply because it was Christmas. He wrote lyrics encouraging them not to give up hope. I like sentiments that are a bit more honest like that. A rebuttal to toxic positivity, if you will. It's like Ierly said, Hope in hard times, beauty that arises from pain. Songs that offer comfort and solace and are inherently human and infinitely adaptable. Somehow, Joseph Moore, back in 1816, with an assist from Franz Gruber, was able to completely nail that. And it still resonates with us over 200 years later.
Well, a quick follow-up on the U.S. Department of Energy's fusion energy announcement that occurred this morning. If you missed yesterday's episode, go listen to that for some more context. But it turns out that those unconfirmed, not yet fully analyzed numbers were indeed more modest than the actual announcement. Per the Financial Times' scoop from some anonymous sources at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, the big announcement was that the lab achieved a net energy gain in a fusion reaction for the first time in history. Now, these reactions have been done a bunch of times by several labs using different methods, but this is the first time one has been able to generate more energy than what they put into it, something that will be crucial for fusion energy to actually one day become a viable power source. While the Financial Times yesterday reported that the reaction had delivered about 2.1 megajoules of energy from the lasers to produce about 2.5 megajoules of energy, the announcement from officials this morning confirmed the numbers as 2.05 megajoules of energy input and 3.15 megajoules of output, so even better than what we thought at first. Of course, that's not counting the over 300 megajoules it took to power the lasers before they delivered that 2.05 megajoules of energy. So it's technically a net gain reaction, which is a historical and significant achievement, but we remain nowhere close to fusion energy being a practical energy source. Still, a very cool development that many people have waited a very long time to see happen. Well, here's a fun story to end on today. Animal control officials in Los Angeles County have just issued the very first license for a resident to keep a unicorn in their backyard. The license, along with a custom heart-shaped tag for a collar, was issued to a six-year-old girl named Madeline who wrote to the LA County Department last month asking for approval to have a unicorn in her backyard if she can find one. Marsha Mayetta, the director of Animal Control and Care, sent Madeline back a letter on official letterhead approving the license under the following conditions. First, the unicorn must be cared for in compliance with all animal caretaking regulations set forth in Los Angeles County Code Title 10, which I assume most six-year-olds are familiar with. Further, the unicorn must be given regular access to sunlight, moonbeams, and rainbows. It also must be fed its favorite treat of watermelon once a week. Its horn must be polished at least once a month, and all sparkles or glitter used on it must be non-toxic and biodegradable. And while the license is approved for whenever Madeline is able to find a unicorn, Mayetta noted that they are indeed very rare to find, and sent along a plush unicorn for Madeline to enjoy in the meantime. Mayetta told the Washington Post that this was the first time in her 21 years at the department that they have received a request for a mythical beast, and that their jobs can be so emotionally draining, witnessing some of the horrific ways that animals are treated, that she and her staff were incredibly uplifted by the letter. They also wanted to encourage the civic responsibility that Madeline took in asking permission from the correct department after her mother suggested she might need permission from the proper authorities to own a unicorn, which Madeline had asked for for her birthday. Madeline doesn't know about the license yet. Her mom is waiting to surprise her with it on her birthday. Meanwhile, Mayetta told The Post that if the department ever gets a request for a dragon license, she will have to refer it to the fire chief. Well, that's going to be it for me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.